Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is nuclear pessimism, and the big question for the lecture is, if nuclear weapons aren't very useful, should we have them? And of course, I want to make a special emphasis on this. I'm taking this as a given, that nuclear weapons aren't very useful. Of course, that's in debate, and I've presented both sides of the argument in the last couple of videos. So we are just going to assume that nuclear weapons aren't very useful and see where that takes us here. So what are the downsides to having nuclear weapons? Well, there are three major ones that I'm going to be covering here. There's a fourth that no pope has ever come from a nuclear weapon state, but that's irrelevant to the discussion here. So the three that we're actually going to focus on are the cost of nuclear weapons, the risk of accidental nuclear warfare, and a third item here that you have to be worried about, rogue nuclear weapons. So what's up with the costs? Well, nuclear weapons are not cheap at all. There's cost of development, cost of delivery, and cost of maintenance. I think a lot of us tend to focus on the first, the cost of development, as being the, the really big barrier to nuclear proliferation. But as it turns out, most of the costs end up taking place afterward. After you've developed that technology to be able to make a nuclear explosion, you still have to worry about delivering it and maintaining those programs and maintaining the security of those programs. And those things do not come cheap. Now, a book called Atomic Audit actually looked at the costs of the United States' program in total, not just the cost of development, but the, these other types of costs. And from 1945 to 1998, in $2012, so I've updated this figure to account for inflation, if we look at that, what is that, that 43-year period, in 2012 dollars, the United States spent $7 trillion dollars on nuclear weapons. And of course, in the 15 years since, I'm sure that you know the United States has spent another trillion on top of that. There are a lot of costs here. And to give you perspective on other foreign policy adventures that the United States has undertaken, the Iraq War, a good solid estimate for the costs of the Iraq War is about $3 trillion. And so we're looking at a twice the cost of an Iraq war to be able to maintain this weapon pro weapons program uh, for 43 years. And of course, we continue doing it. So pretty soon we're going to get to the cost of three Iraq wars or the equivalent of three Iraq wars. So nuclear weapons aren't cheap at all. There's also risk to having nuclear weapons out there in the world. Unlike a conventional weapon, like a, a bomber or like a gun, it's much easier to accidentally destroy the world with nuclear weapons. Because with the, the snap of a finger, you can go from peace and prosperity in the world to having, say, 200 nuclear explosions in the 200 most populated centers of the world, and suddenly the world has gone to hell. You can't do that with aerial bombers or guns or anything like that. War takes place in a much more deliberate manner when we're dealing with conventional weapons as opposed to nuclear weapons. And while obviously we haven't had any serious nuclear accidents yet, this is a recurring theme in film and books and that sort of thing. And also there's there's some sense of reality to it. So if you've ever seen Dr. Strangelove, there is, it's a wonderful film, so you should go out and see it if you haven't. But the, the general plot line of Dr. Strangelove is that there's a rogue U.S. general who decides that inserting fluoride into American water is a communist plot to take over the country. And so he takes it on to himself to start a preemptive nuclear war against the Soviet Union to save the United States from this communist fluoride plot. And that's, that's strange, and it's funny, it's a great film, but there's actual serious risk here. So I, I made a mention of this 1983 incident. In September of 1983, there was, well, in 1983 in general, there were heightened uh, tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union. This was soon after a Korean air liner got shot down over the Soviet Union, causing tensions between the Cold War blocs. And in September of 1983, the United States and, and NATO allies were planning on conducting some drills, uh, some war games. And the United States had alerted the Soviet Union that, hey, you know, we're going to be doing something in September where there are going to be war games. Don't worry about it. Of course, the Soviet Union is always very concerned when someone says, hey, there's going to be something going on. Don't worry about it. If you know a little bit about World War II history, on the eve of the invasion of the Soviet Union, Germany and the Soviet Union were allegedly allies at the time. Germany started building up soldiers on the eastern border that borders with the Soviet Union. And Hitler had, had informed Stalin. He said, hey, Stalin, you know, we're going to be putting some troops on the eastern border. Please don't pay any attention to them. All we're doing is we're trying to shelter them from the front lines on the west. We're not actually doing anything here. Don't worry about it. Of course, that ended up turning into a big war. So the Soviet Union, of course, cognizant of the fact that, you know, hey, maybe, might be unlikely, but maybe these war games are just a cover for an actual invasion. September 1983, well, during this, 
uh, this guy Stanislav Petrov was in a uh, like a listening station in the Soviet Union that's supposed to detect uh, an incoming missile barrage, a nuclear missile barrage from the United States. There are false alarms of a few weapons that are coming toward the Soviet Union. And according to, you know, traditional operating procedures, Stanislav Petrov is supposed to inform everyone, hey, you know, this might be a big nuclear invasion and we need to be really, really careful. As it turns out, everything was fine. Uh, this, the Stanislav Petrov guy deciphered that, you know, hey, if the United States were to be launching a large nuclear assault, then there would be a bunch of nuclear weapons. It would be an all-out attack and not just like five or six that were appearing on the radar. So cooler heads prevailed here. But you can imagine a situation where we have a less cool guy sitting there in that listening post and somebody who actually is more interested in starting a war. If he were to see these few missiles popping up, he might start pushing other guys to counter-strike while they still can and, and launch that second strike before the Soviet Union was completely wiped out. So, yes, we evaded this one, no problem, in 1983, but you could imagine that if the circumstances are just um, a slightly different, a big difference, that you end up with a hugely different outcome where instead of having peace, you end up with no world whatsoever. So that's a really big danger and something that we have to be cognizant of. And then the last issue, and this has come up more recently since the end of the Cold War. Well, during the Cold War, we had a huge number of nuclear weapons in the world, 68,000 active nuclear weapons during the height of the Cold War. Since the Cold War has ended, that has become less necessary, and we've refocused the point of our nuclear program, where because we're no longer as concerned about Russia and the United States fighting a nuclear war against one another, we've cut down on the number of missiles that are actually active. So now the world only has 4,100 active nuclear weapons. And one of the reasons that we've done this is that we want to be really careful with existing nuclear weapons and make sure that they don't fall into someone else's hands, right? We don't want to have some rogue guy getting a nuclear weapon because, you know, a rogue terrorist, yeah, they can do a lot of damage. We saw that in September 11th. But imagine what a rogue terrorist could do with a nuclear weapon instead of just a few planes. So this is one of the reasons why we've cut down on that nuclear stockpile to try to make sure that there are fewer nuclear weapons and we're, be uh, we're better able and better equipped to understand where those nuclear weapons are and to make sure that they don't fall into the wrong person's hands. Now, those are the three disadvantages to having nuclear weapons. And, you know, we've talked about whether we should have had nuclear weapons or not. And, you know, you hear in Washington people talking about dismantling all American warheads and all warheads in general and getting rid of nuclear weapons from the world. The fact of the matter is no one who has a position of power in Washington is actually seriously interested in doing that. All of this is just talk, and that's it. They're just talking about this because it sounds nice, it sounds peaceful, and it sounds loving, but no one in Washington is really serious about getting rid of all of these American weapons. So, you know, here are the disadvantages of nuclear weapons, but as it turns out, power policymakers in Washington, those with power, are actually entrenched in keeping the nuclear stockpile. Your decision about whether that's a good thing or not, th or not a good thing, we've looked at both sides of it. Okay, so that wraps up this video. And in the next video, we're going to start talking not about the macro ideas of, of nuclear weapons, like mutually assured destruction, and whether that's actually something that's good or not, and whether nuclear weapons are overall useful for the world in promoting peace. We're going to switch away from that, and we're going to start talking about these micro issues of my decision as a country, forgetting about whether you know everyone else has nuclear weapons or not. Do I want to proliferate? Why would I want to proliferate? What's going to stop me from proliferating? So that's what we're going to be talking about in the next video. So join me in that next lecture when we start talking about bargaining over nuclear weapons. Hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you next time. Take care.